All right, welcome back uh, for the afternoon session. I hope everyone had uh, lunch and is uh, well awake for our, uh, for the session. It's my pleasure to share, share it. And the first talk will be given by Stuart Adams, uh, presenting a magic trick that we can see the invisible. Okay, thanks very much. So I'm gonna begin um, thanking the organizers. It's a wonderful meeting. I'm very happy to be part of this great community. We've such, seen such a, a wide range of fascinating physics so far, and hopefully I'm gonna to add to that a little bit. I work on lots of different things, um, but I've chosen to speak about things that no one else has talked about yet. That's a very risky strategy because maybe no one else is speaking about these things because nobody else is interested in them, but uh, I'm gonna do it anyway. So I'm gonna talk about some, some of the work that we're doing that's a little bit different to things that you've heard about so far. Now, before I do that, I just want to mention, this is my first um, in-person conference talk for five years, so last time 2018. And that's because I, <laughs> that's because I gave apply in 2019. You can, um, Matt Jones and myself wrote this article in Physics World in 2019. I self-declared a climate emergency on my life at that point, which meant I had to change. Um, how I go about my life, basically. Um, and it also means I do a lot of work on sustainability within the university now. Um, so I, I live the Marxian dream. I say, you know, I work on sustainability in the morning, teaching in the afternoon, and uh, river physics in the evening. But I, I'm not going to say any more about that. But if you want to talk about these other things, um, we can do that at the conference dinner or over some wine tonight. So, so coming then to uh, Rydberg physics, I think this conference so so far has been a, a really beautiful example of the, the richness and the diversity of Rydberg physics. And I want to sort of add to that and broaden it even further. And, and just as a sort of overview, what makes these Rydberg systems so magic, I think, is that when we look at these energy level diagrams for any atom, there are just so many states in an atom, and there are so many transitions at such a wide range of, of wavelengths. And, and we have the possibility of accessing all these different frequencies and all these different sizes of dipoles. So, so this is a plot that uh, Lucy Downs in Durham made for me where it's just a plot basically of transition wavelengths in cesium. And you see, you, you can span six orders of magnitude in, in the electromagnetic spectrum. And then on this axis, we have the dipole moment. And of course, as we know, we can have enormous dipoles up to you know, 10,000 to buy. Um, and basically we can tune our system to do the type of physics that we want to do. So whatever physics you can imagine doing, you, know, you can almost find a way of doing that with your Rydberg atoms. And I always think it's ironic that I used to say I've spent most of my career down here just exciting up to this first excited state, but now I've been doing Rydberg physics so long that I've actually spent more than half my career sort of messing around up here. Um, okay, so as I said, I'm going to talk about some things that build on the themes that we've seen already, but take them in a different direction. So we've heard a lot about sensors, so using atoms to see things. So that's this theme of seeing the invisible. We can see microwave fields. Sense of our atoms. There was nice talks about seeing positrobia and also seeing molecules. We'll hear more about that from Simon today. I'm going to talk about seeing phase transitions and, and some new, a new twist on this. But I'm going to start on talking about our work on terahertz imaging, which is related to this sensing thing, but a slightly different sort of direction to what we've seen uh, so far. Now, I'm not going to say much about Rydberg atom arrays. Uh, but I wanted to say one thing about it because uh, Christian was saying we should add to his um, list of, uh, and I think everyone's missed one of these early references um, to what the, the first Rydberg atom array or, or first atom array, tweezer array. And actually, this is, uh, it's an interesting one because it's not in the literature, it's actually in the pavement or sidewalk of Library Walk in New York City. And if you walk down that street, one of the things in that pavement is this picture here. And you see it's actually a beautiful sort of Rydberg array with an arrangement that solves this maximum independence problem with Manhattan, it turns out. Um, and there's a lovely quote in here by Muriel Ruckheiser, who was a poet. And uh, it says, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. So instead of atoms at each site in there, 
squeezer array, they have books. And uh, I think that's also good for us in our community because we have many good stories to tell about the, this diverse physics. So, so I'm going to tell you some, some different stories, some other stories. So firstly about um, terahertz imaging, what we've been doing about that. It's a, it's a reasonably old story, you know, a few years old now. Um, but, um, so, but, but maybe if you're not familiar, I can tell some of that. And then also a bit about phase transition. So I like this picture because we actually see with our own eyes, you know, that's a normal camera picture, a sort of phase transition where, where this fluorescence goes from green here to orange. So I'll tell you about that. But the reason why I want to tell you about, that's an old story, but the reason I tell you about that is because we discovered something new in the last year, which I think is quite interesting. And again, it relates to a, a big range of um, physics that we see in other systems. So it's a nonlinear dynamics problem known as synchronization. So, and there's a recent paper um, that we just put on the archive. All this work was done by a single master student, uh, Karen Badenfeld. So she takes all the credit both for the experiments and the theory that I'll show you. Okay, so terahertz imaging, some other stories, part one. Um, so why did we get started on this? Um, so, so as I said earlier on, Rydberg's are great. We've got all these transitions in six, covering six orders of magnitude of the electromagnetic spectrum from sort of tens of megahertz up to uh, even you know, UV transitions in some of our atoms. So we can reach any region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the way... Well, the way we thought about that was there's loads going on in microwave and there's loads going on with optics, but there's, no, there's a sort of gap here and it's often referred to as the terahertz gap. And so we wanted to go there and I know we used to say, well, there's not much going on there, but now we go to terahertz conferences and if you say that in a terahertz conference, they, they, they shoot you. you know? <laughs> Obviously, they've devoted their whole life to it. So there is a lot going on there, actually, but it's something that we hadn't been there. So we said, let's go and do terahertz. So, so that's sort of how we got started. And now we can take these beautiful pictures of terahertz fields, and it's basically terahertz to optical conversion. So it's a very, very simple idea, but it works quite well. Um, so I'll show you basically how that works. So this paper, um, the, most of the work I'm gonna show you was done by Lucy Downs um, in Durham as part of our thesis. And uh, this, uh, the terahertz group is led by my colleague, uh, Kevin Weberall. So it's a collaboration um, between us. Now, so the idea is then we excite a Rydberg atom up to some region where we have strong terahertz transition. So you don't wanna go super high in the, in the Rydberg series because it's way up, at the top, you get microwave transitions. So if you go to a state like around n equals sort of 15 to 20, you get you get strong terahertz transitions. So this is an example where basically we excite the 14p state and we excite it with three photons. There isn't an especial reason why we did that. The reason why we started doing three photon excitation is because we couldn't afford another one of those uh, expensive double blazers. So we decided to do everything with diodes. So that was sort of historic for why we started on this free photon stuff. Um, so that's what we do, excite with free infrared lasers up to 14p. And then the terahertz drives the transition from 14p uh, to 13d. And then this 13d state can decay by a fast transition back to 6p. Now, all of these are infrared photons, so you don't see them, you don't see this, but then this photon um, decays by the emission of green light, and it's that green light that we detect. So there can be some decay from here, which is sort of orange as indicated, but this is, this is not as strong. It can decay to a whole bunch of other states, but this transition is much stronger, as I'll show you in, in a minute. And then the experiment is really simple, so I like simple experiments. Um, so this is basically the setup. There is a sort of complicated part with all the lasers not shown in the diagram. But basically the lasers that do the excitation go along a single axis here. So we have these three photons. It doesn't really matter which way you propagate them. They're all co uh, I think one of them is counter propagating in this, in this system. But basically they excite these atoms up to this 14p state. So they're just sitting, there's some Rydberg atoms sitting there. And then the terahertz field comes out of this source here. So you can buy these, uh, these, these sources. It, it, it's very 
it's sort of like a laser, so that's why I like it a little bit more than likewise, because you can sort of focus it and it actually behaves pretty much like a, a Gaussian beam with a very long wavelength. It has funny optics. Um, so these are Teflon optics that you, but you can they pretty much collimate it and, and use your Gaussian beam optics to describe what goes on. So we just collimate this terahertz source and then we, we send it through a mask. Um, so it goes through a one-to-one -to -one sort of imaging, then it gets imaged into the uh, cell. And then that creates this fluorescence from the Rydberg atoms, which we then detect on a normal CCD camera. And that's basically the sort of whole, whole story of how this experiment works. So, so we can put in any mass that we want. And this is one of the ones that we got fabricated in our workshop because the, the wavelength is sort of half a millimeter. You can, you can sort of just um, fab cut these things out, these shapes, and then image them sort of one to one, and then see them inside your in, in, image them inside your cell. So we send the terahertz through this psi here, and then you see a psi inside your vapor cell, and you can that's a true color image. So you see this sort of green fluorescence on the background of this orange here, and then you can do slightly better. This is a false color image. So if you filter out the orange and just take the green you get slightly better signal to noise. So what we've been doing more recently is just seeing how far we can sort of push this technology and get the sensitivity up and also try to uh, reduce the background. And, and we have made quite a lot of progress in understanding how to make it better, um, but it's very, it's mostly technical and uh, um, not so interesting. So as I mentioned, one thing that maybe is interesting is just looking at these fluorescent spectra so basically, without the terahertz, we see this orange line here. There's lots of decay channels, but none of them are particularly strong. And then when we put on the terahertz field, it goes whoosh down in that strong transition down to that 6P state. And nearly all the light comes out on this green line. And, and so we put an interference filter that just sits on, that's this sort of gray shading here, just so that we can filter out some of this background. So that gives you slightly clean, cleaner images. Um, and it looks like we've found at least uh, one of the best. So you can search all the Rydberg series to find better combinations. So you can look at all the rate equations and find which states are going to give you the best visibility. And this is quite a good one. There are some others, um, and I'll show you in a minute, just one thing that we did where we go to a higher. This is at about 0.5 terahertz, and we've done some stuff also at one terahertz. Now, the good part of all this is it works really well. Um, so when you compare it to what, what else is out there, at least on some criteria, it's a very, very nice terahertz detector. So uh, this is a plot of, um, basically, if you want to do terahertz video, you can say, what is my frame rate? So you might want to, and, and it's, and it's like, what, what is the minimum exposure time that I can have? How quickly can I take a picture of something? And this is sensitivity and better is at the top here. So this is a small number, this is a big number. Um, and, and basically this is sort of different detectors that were in this review article from 2018. They're all sort of down here. So you didn't have very, very fast video and not super sensitivity. And our Rydberg atoms were already sort of way over here. So we can do very fast video and we can do it with a very high sensitivity. So it's kind of much better. Um, and basically, we're yeah we're waiting for someone to come with the killer application. But most companies, yeah, they're very excited, but they say they want it for fifty quid, um, <laughs> uh, fifty pounds. Um, so they say, well, no, we can't do it for that. So so we're still waiting for the perfect uh, customer to buy these things. Now it's I like this picture because it shows how we're diffraction limited. So when you look at this psi. It is in the focal plane, but it's a sort of diffraction limited image. And so you get this fun, slightly funny fuzzy pattern. Um, but if you go to higher frequency, then you can see how the image sharpens up as you'd expect. So, so it, it's kind of fun to play with these uh, electromagnetic fields that have a wavelength of a fraction of a millimeter, I think. And, and you actually, there's some very nice vector optics that we've been looking at recently where you can basically measure the vector field components of your terahertz fields in, in interesting ways. So that's mostly what I want to say about the, the terahertz um, imaging stuff. And then, so I'm going to come on to the sort of second story now, the second part of the talk, which will be slightly longer. And the, this story starts a bit about um, phase transitions. And then I'm going to go on to talk about this new aspect that we discovered in the, in the last year 
which is this synchronization topic. So this actually started, it goes, it predates the terahertz. So I, I mentioned how we use this three photon transition because we couldn't afford another um, laser to do the Rydberg excitation. So we started doing these three photon experiments. And the nice thing was, because they were all infrared, we, when we shone these lasers into just a vapor cell, so this is a cesium vapor cell at room temperature, then we, you'd see this fluorescence. So in this case, you see this green fluorescence from the Rydberg states just decaying by optical transitions. And then the, the surprise was that if we went to slightly higher temperature of the cell, that the color of this fluorescence changed really dramatically. And, and we found that we could drive between these different phases, if you like, the, the green phase and the orange phase. And we wrote a paper at the time called Non-Equilibrium Phase Transition in this dilute Rydberg Ensemble, which is just all thermal cell stuff. Um, so the, the referees didn't like it, but um, when we did a bit of phenomenological theory, then they were happy, um, strangely. Um, so, so this is just shows that picture. This is the, the high density cell. So it's a two millimeter long cell just looking in here. And uh, when, when we drive it at low power, we see this uh, uh, green fluorescence. And as we increase the power coming from this direction, then it turns to this orange color. So there's definitely something dramatic happening. And uh, you can see this phase boundary between these different phases. So this orange is a high Rydberg phase, high number of Rydberg atoms, and this green is a low density of Rydberg. So, um, so what was the model that we did at the time? And it's still the model that we use. It's a very simple model. So the idea is that we, we have, so this is, um, they, here I'm showing a sort of two photon scheme, but it kind of works the same whether you have more photons or not. But so basically we drive up to some Rydberg state here via an intermediate state. And the intermediate state has got a fast decay. Um, so it's a driven dissipative system. So we need some dissipation in there as well. Um, and what happens is we know the Rydberg state can move. It's very sensitive to things. So there's some kind of shift of the Rydberg state that depends on its local environment. So it depends on if there were other Rydberg atoms nearby, we know we would get these kind of van der Waals or resonant dipole-dipole shifts. Or if there are any ions in the cell or electric fields, then we would get stark shifts. So these Rydberg levels tend to shift and they shift in a way that's proportional to the Rydberg population. So what we put in then is a, is a shift term. So it looks very much like the blockade physics um, where you've got some, some energy times a density. And then we put that in, and typically the power law we use is just linear. So this, this density to the power beta typically beats us of order one. So we're just putting in a level shift that's proportional to the population of the Rydberg state. Now, what we, this is very much a phenomenological model. So we're not saying where this level shift comes from. And there's now accumulating evidence that ions possibly play a more important role than just the the dipole-dipole uh, interactions. So we think that the role of ions is, in, is very important in this, in this system. Now, when you, when you do that and you solve your optical block equations with this nonlinearity, then you get a very funny line shape. So basically your line now skews. So rather than your usual Lorentzian um, that's nice and symmetric, basically as you drive more population to the Rydberg state, then you shift the Rydberg state, which just bends this, this sort of line over. Um, and it, it actually, look, it's very much characteristic of a nonlinear oscillator, these van der Paul type oscillators, where, where if you drive them harder, then they change their resonant frequency. So it looks like a nonlinear oscillator, basically. Um, now, what's interesting about this is all the branches in this curve. So, so basically, you can't sit on this branch here that has, has this it's like an overhang. So basically, as you as you scan across this resonance and you get to this point here, you jump up onto this curve and then continue. And if you come back in this direction, then you get to the top here and fall off a cliff and go down there. So so this these kind of uh, nonlinear dynamics curves are characteristic of things like bistability, and we do see optical bistability in our system. So that's an interesting behavior. And it's, it's analogous to some of the physics you can see also in cavities where you see cavity optical bistability as well. So here it's driven by the 
interactions, um, whereas in, in a cavity it's driven by the cavity feedback. But basically, the sort of models and the physics are sort of the same. So, um, and that just shows. Now, you could ask well, just a very simple model, and if you do this in a thermal room temperature vapor, you've got all these Doppler effects, and isn't it all going to be a mess? Well. It is more of a mess, but it basically still works. So this is a calculation that Karen did, where um, um, which includes all the Doppler shifts, and then you sort of measure the line shape, and basically you see this same transition occurring also in uh, in a in a thermal ensemble with with the Doppler effect and everything. So so it still works. In you don't have to do this with any cold atom system. So if we look at some real data now, so I've chosen this data from a group in China that's um, the group of Dongsheng Ding. So it, they're in Heipei um, at the China, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And they, um, dongsheng has been working with me for some, some sort of years on these kind of biostability uh, issues. Um, and we had a recent paper last year where we looked at this um, phase transition. So this is their, their data. So if you drive the system not too strongly, you see your usual sort of resonance. So this is scanning one of the lasers through the Rydberg resonance. And so that's the normal. Um, and then you, you drive it <clears throat> a little bit harder. So you put more population into the Rydberg state. You see an enormous broadening of the line. But now you see this sort of basically this um, bistability. So as you scan this way, you jump up. Um, and if he had scanned back the other way, you would jump down at a slightly different place and you see this by stability window uh, open up. Now, the point of this paper was to sort of say, um, it's, it's kind of a trivial point and, and maybe it's not that useful, but maybe it's also a useful point to make that we know if we want to measure something and we always say it's slope times shift, you know, so if I'm sitting on some slope here and I want to measure some external parameter, and that parameter shifts my resonance, and it's how steep is the slope and how much shift I get. So my sensitivity is always slope sign shift. And then of course I have some noise. So it's like, how big is that effect relative to my noise? And so what's clear at this bi-stability step or this, this, um, this nonlinear system is that I have this very steep slope here. So you have this enormous sensitivity. So, so the point of writing this paper was just to say, we got this really steep slope so we can do enhanced metrology at this critical point. So if I sit here and something changes in the world then I'm gonna see a big change. Whereas if I'm sitting here and the same thing happens, I only see a little change. So that's that's um, the paper that we we wrote. So so let's have a look at this kind of data. So basically, this these top graphs are basically an expanded view. Um, one that um, no, they're not quite an expanded view. So they're a plot versus some external field, which is a microwave field. So basically, we sit on the side of the resonance um, in this what's called the single body case, where we don't have this step. And you can see that you have to if you change by a factor of seven then you see a small change in the transmission of your probe light. So it's going from 0.5 millivolts per centimeter up to 3.5. So this factor of seven change in the microwave field gives you this small shift. So that's a little bit hard to measure. But if you do the same experiment now in, the, in what we call the many body system where we have this uh, bi-stability, so this very steep slope, this phase transition, we sit at the critical point um, then when the microwave field drives this phase transition, then we see this very enhanced sensitivity. So these numbers go from basically here to move up and down this curve is only a 10% change. So it goes from 1.94 to 2.06 millivolts per sensitive. So you have this massively enhanced sensitivity to small effects. Of course, you also massively enhance your sensitivity to any noise in your system. But that's generally true of all these sensor um, measurements that you're always sensitive to noise and um, but uh, yeah so if you enhance your sensitivity to the measure you might also enhance your sensitivity to noise so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're sort of winning overall depending on the noise character of your of, of your system you still have to work hard to make sure that you don't have any noise in the system so that's one thing that you can do now, in working with uh, Dong Sheng and also Wai Bin, who's going to talk later, but maybe not about this, um, we, we, we started to see some other weird stuff associated in the vicinity of these phase transitions. 
So what Dongsheng did was he sort of mapped out. So up here, this line here is this phase transition. And then he mapped this out as a function of the uh, of, of one of the laser intensities. And um, as he um, scanned through resonance on one of these systems, he saw this uh, strange oscillations. Um, and my initial reaction was, oh, it's probably just you know, laser noise or something like that. But he managed to convince me that maybe there was some physics going on here. Um, and he sort of made a, made a study of that, um, which uh, has now appeared on the, on the archive. But I was sufficiently interested in what the heck was going on with these oscillations to think, well, let's do an experiment in Durham. So we tried to reproduce the effect that he'd seen in Hefei in, in Durham. And that's where uh, Karen um, Vadenfeld, a master student from Heidelberg, who was visiting us in Durham, came in. And so she set up an experiment, which is a very simple, you know, vapor cell experiment with uh, exciting to a Rydberg state where we do a two photon excitation um, using an infrared photon and then one of these. Uh, um, 480 blue photons in iridium, and then we scan this second blue laser and look at this resonance. So it's essentially the EIT resonance. And if we do it at low power, which is this curve at the bottom here, then we see a usual sort of resonance line shape. Then you increase the intensity of the laser. Then you start to see this uh, um, phase transition step, like we'd seen before. We were sort of familiar with that. And then you increase it a little bit more, and now you start to see these oscillations. And for us, the os oscillations were even more dramatic than the ones that Dong Sheng saw. And you can see that as we increase the power even more, that basically these oscillations were kind of everywhere. So, so, so for years we've done these experiments, never seen any oscillations, and then suddenly, uh, when you look a little bit harder, you find that they're, they're everywhere, and you can't sort of get rid of them anymore. Um, so, but they are a little bit hard to see, but you have to sort of really believe you're going to see them. To, so you keep doing the experiments, changing the parameters until you find them, because there are critical regimes where, where you only see these oscillations. So they're, they're not sort of always there, let's say, but there are sets of parameters where you see them in the, in the phase diagram, which is quite a big complex space of, of many parameters. Now, these oscillations are basically continuous. So if you sit, so this is showing the scans here. So how it arises as a function of the frequency. But if you just sit anywhere in this space, they basically just keep going. So they, they just oscillate forever at that point. So if you sit here, the system just sort of oscillates in time, as I'll show you a bit later. And then, then it turned out someone else had, see, had seen this. And there's some members from the Xinhua um, group in Beijing here, um, um, but they'd also seen similar things and their paper also appeared on the archive recently. And you see that, that these are their resonances. And again, if you sort of expand up the curve, you also see uh, resonances. So the, their explanation is, and theory is slightly different to ours, but it looks like the same phenomenon. They also had a magnetic field. But so, so basically from going from a position where nobody had seen these sort of oscillations, so suddenly they're proliferating and they're popping up in everybody's experiments, which is often the case. Um, so, so what the heck's going on? So it's not completely unexpected that we can see this, and you can find it in the model, actually, if you try to look at the right um, equations. And if you're familiar with sort of nonlinear dynamics, then you'll know that this kind of system with a nonlinear oscillator system uh, these van der Poel oscillators, they have the possibility of having hot bifurcations and then going into limit cycle regimes. And then once you get into this limit cycle thing, you get that you can have this phenomenon known as synchronization, which I'll tell you a little bit about. And I think it's quite fascinating, but at least it's fun, the synchronization phenomenon. So you're probably very familiar uh, with this idea, and you've probably seen this very nice demo that people do with metronomes. Now, this is a video from this Veritasium. They have a very, very nice sort of outreach uh, video on this topic of synchronization. I'll show you some of their other videos. But, but basically what you do is you put a bunch of metronomes, and even if they have different oscillator frequencies, and you put them on this moving table, then uh, I'll play it again. Um, why not? I don't know how I'm doing for time, but uh, yeah. Um, you have to move it. Okay, yeah, so I got plenty of time. It's good. Cool. Um, so, yeah, so you, you set up these oscillators. They can have different frequencies, but if we put them on this moving table, that acts as essentially the, the mean field. So 
So it plays the role of our, in our Rydberg system of this mean field shift term that we have, and that basically makes our oscillators oscillate in phase. So it, it synchronizes these oscillators. So, so I think looking at this picture, you think of, the, of all of this as our driving to the Rydberg state. So this oscillation is, is our coupling to the Rydberg state. And then the platform that they all sit on is the mean field shift. So this V rho R, R term, which is now spread over our whole, whole cell, or actually that's an interesting question. How, how does this mean field spread throughout the system, which I'll sort of just touch on at the end of the talk. Now, because we're in London, um, I thought I'd show one of the other videos from that film. And so they built this famous bridge. It was called the Millennium Bridge. And, and actually they opened this bridge and everybody went on this bridge. And you can see what happened. Um, see, they're all going back and forth. You know? <laughs> it's like they're all oscillating back and forth. And basically, and this is something that's been known for years that when soldiers, so when soldiers march over bridges, they're supposed to break their step so that they don't set the uh, set off a resonance in the bridge, and, and basically the bridge falls down. So everybody went on this bridge. It started oscillating like that, and they had to close the bridge, and and they had to redesign it. So apparently, bridge designers know about this, but maybe not the ones that designed that bridge. Apparently, so <laughs> um, yeah. So that and so basically, this is the same thing that's going on in our cell. So this is calculations from um, Karen again, and um, that's appeared in our paper now. What was really surprising to me is, that, imagine this is a, you know, a thermal vapor. We've got these atoms that are being driven to the Rydberg state um, and then back down to the ground state. Um, but now they're all moving around a few hundred meters a second and they're not staying very close to their neighbors for very long. So it's actually really surprising in this sort of chaotic environment. And I think that's why I never, although I was aware of synchronization, I never thought that a thermal vapor would synchronize because there's too much chaotic you know, thermal motion. So, so that was a sort of surprising thing. And we thought, well, if, it, if, we, if we now do see it in experiment, it must be there in the theory. And that's what this simulation shows that if you, if you base all these different colors here at the bottom are the different velocity classes in the medium. So they're all got different Doppler detunings. And then this black curve is kind of the sum of all of those. And if we, that's a weak driving. And then when we drive it more strongly, you basically see some of these velocity classes have this oscillatory behavior and they basically couple to one another. So they all start out with some sort of random frequencies depending on their detunings. But then as you go to longer time, they can synchronize with one another through this, you know, basically oscillating table, which is this uh, mean field term. And, and, and then the sum now is this black curve. And so it's weak, you know, it's a small little oscillation, but it basically survives in the Doppler average. So that was the sort of surprising result that we now see both in theory and experiment. These are the sort of spectral responses. And this is where the oscillations occur, where there are these big error bars is, is basically the amplitude of the oscillations in, in those regions. So, so we now have a theory, it, you know, basically the simple phenomenological model that we've been using all along basically displays this synchronization behavior as you'd expect. Now there's some really nice things in the model. I think that the, the basically the limit cycles depend on the parameters. So in, in, for different detunings in your system, you get different types of limit cycles and different types of oscillations. So this just shows a selection here that these color coded curves uh, correspond to different detunings of the coupling laser and you can see massively different so you, sometimes it looks quite sort of um, sinusoidal sometimes it looks quite sort of uh, sawtooth like and what's interesting is the model basically shows something fairly similar where we see these different types of behavior in different detuning regimes and I think it was sort of this curve that in, encouraged us that our model um, was really had making some sense in terms of it could predict these different behaviors in these different uh, regions. So there's still there's still a lot of things we need to understand. Um, more experiments we could do. So we don't we certainly don't claim to understand everything, but we're fairly confident that this basic phenomenological model is describing what we see. Now you can ask. I did mention at the beginning. You can ask: Is it dipole-dipole interactions or is it ions? 
So we've done a lot of studies versus for different Rydberg states. So here you see uh, different, um, so N quantum numbers, 43, 50D, 63D. Uh, we vary the temperature, which varies the density of atoms in the, in the cell. So that varies the nearest neighbor distance between the atoms. And you can look at how these oscillation regions, so these shaded regions are the oscillation regions um, for each of these cases. And you can look at how it grows. Okay. Um, now, the reason why we think um, that it's probably ions rather than dipole-dipole is because this 43D state is very close to a Forster resonance. So it actually has a much bigger dipole-dipole interaction than 50, whereas the scaling go goes very much with the N quantum number. So, so if you go and look at all your, so I don't expect you to follow everything on these, but it's basically the top set of curves are the dipole-dipole interactions. So this 43 has quite big shifts relative to 50, um, but the stark shifts are, um, are, are um, follow a different sort of scaling law. Um, and, and so it seems like the size of these oscillation regions follow the stark effect rather than the dipole-dipole effect. So that's why we think that the ions are playing a role in this effect. So I just want to quickly say about sort of outlook. So when you look in the world, and uh, I think someone else had a, a chemistry slide because we're in the chemistry department. So, so I thought th there's some very nice stuff on this synchronization. Uh, this is what chemists do, is they mix funny things together and get patterns. Um, this is called the Belusev zalatinsky reaction, and it's a very nice example of uh, synchronization, where if you sit in one place, then you get a repeated oscillation between these phases. But the thing also has a spatial pattern, which is something we haven't looked at. So there are very interesting questions about, about the spatial distribution of this mean field that we could now use to, to study with this synchronization effect. And the other one that you may have heard of is uh, these um, fireflies um, in trees. Um, this is a simulation by a computer games program at Nikki Case of, of fireflies. And actually you see how the, in, this, in this system and in these simulations, you can change the parameters in such a way that you can see stuff start to build and you see how spatial patterns. So initially there isn't necessarily a, a global blinking, it's a local blinking and then it spreads out in waves across the system. So, so I think the experiment we'd like to do is a bit like, imagine you've got fireflies in this tree and they start synchronizing and there's another tree and they start synchronizing, but there's the two trees synchronize with one another and that does that depend upon the distance between them so that would be a very simple experiment we can do and then we can measure the length scales of the and the scaling laws of these mean fields and also the time dependence how temporarily that builds up in our system okay so i'm pretty much at the end i was under a lot of pressure last night to keep to time <laughs> so they said they're gonna yeah they, i don't know what they're gonna do if i go over time but i think i've done well um, <laughs> So, so I, just to summarize then, uh, amazing diversity in our community. It's a pleasure to be a part of it. I've told you some stories that are a little bit different about terahertz imaging, driven Rydberg systems, just in a noisy thermal environment, very simple experiments. But I think, I still think this is a wonderful playground for nonlinear dynamics. You can do theory and experiment. So yeah, thanks very much. In the driven experiment, the vapors are the right word is why is the color change? Um, yeah, so it's different decay tones. So basically, as you go, so the question is so when you go to the first step, it has to decay from a P state, so it changes to X, and then the low state, so it decays to a generally sort of higher, um, so it has you know, a short, uh, long wavelength um, than when you. It's just a different number of rigors that I need to do more. It's not the, it's, it's which states, it's what, which are the leading terms in the decay channels. We actually modeled the full rate equation, but let's say you go to the P state, what are the branching ratios to go down every path? And it matches pretty well the, the, the colors that we see in the intent. So when you do a spec, you know, you look on a spectrum analyzer of what, of what lines you get. It pretty much maps to what you'd expect from the rate of the world. Maybe we talk later, but when yeah. does that change from your type or on that river? Oh, the, um, yeah, so that, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think maybe it's a slightly different question, yeah.
So I answered more the terror of imaging question than that. Yeah, so we always, yeah, so we tried to say that that was a kind of super radiant effect. Um, that basically, there's super radiance within the um, river manifold. And so there's a very rapid decay on the initial. So you get the origin, basically, you, you do a pass down between the river states and then get these long wavelength photon panels. But we never really proved that. Um, What's that? All right. Another question here. In that spot on the bottom, yes, the huge gap in both of the lines. The huge gap between the black line and the no, no, no. towards the right hand side. There's just a big white bar in the middle of the spot. Oh, that, no, yes, yeah, so that's a time gap. Right, so it's just to show so that's it, early time evolution, and then there's a yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So it was just to show how stable the oscillations were how long it was. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Question about it's not about visual state, but it was in Zellenbuch, uh, yeah, the yeah. reaction because we show that in our kinetics lecture mm -hmm. as an example of an oscillatory reaction, yeah. But I've never seen, but I did the experiment uh, on the, in front of the class, but I've never seen this facial thing. So can you just take it over here? Well, you, you should watch the video. So on this video by Veritasium. So th this is, that particular video is from, it seems. What we see in the lecture, what is that the color goes blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yeah, yellow the, for minutes. And the, now this is a new thing to me. So. Maybe I want to do that in the next Well, I, it, for this video, he sh um, it shows this. It says video courtesy of Nile Red. So I, I presume there's some kind of dye dye company or something like that, and uh, and maybe they add some dye to the, to the mixture, and the dye associates itself more with one phase than the other, and so that's why you see these very intense colors in the in the chemistry system yeah. you're a chemist <laughs> um, i don't know i don't know other than the the, the, the yeah i don't know i haven't <laughs> yeah. uh, can we postpone this further okay so in the interest of time let's maybe thank uh, Stuart again and